Well, hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls from around the world. It's Timmy, or Timothy. Welcome. <laughs> okay, sorry. I always like to start out goofy. Welcome to the prayer call for today, the last day of August. Mm, took a couple days off, so everything is all good in the hood. A little recharging of the battery. Get some wind in the sail. And today we're going to pick up in Timothy where we left off, which should be the second chapter of the second letter. And uh, we're going to do the devotionals. I had a question. Uh, what is a devotional? Or what are devotionals? And, uh, well, I'm not Webster, so I couldn't tell you, like, uh, by the book definition, but it's time that you set aside and commit to devote to God. And devotionals aren't limited to God, but in our case, in context, and the frame of reference, it's definitely in regard to setting aside time for God and devoting and committing to that. So the book I read from is Charles Spurgeon. He has a book called Morning and Evening Devotionals. It's two days. And, um... Yeah, so that's what a devotional is. So Mr. Spurgeon has a book that's already pre-planned to a day for every day of the year. And uh, you can do your own devotional, or there's other methods or models if you want to follow those. But this book was gifted to me, and um, it's been a great help in my commitment and uh, perseverance in my relationship with God. So, um, yeah, if it can help you too. I think you can get them for about 20 bucks online. Uh, if you shop around, you can get them uh, cheaper than that. So, But you don't even have to get it. I think you can get it free on BibleGateway.com or Mr. Spurgeon has a website. I think you can get it free from his organization. Um, PDF format if you care to. Um, so yeah, that's that. Had somebody ask me if I recommend any Bibles in particular. Uh, I tend to stick with King James Version myself. I prefer the authorized King James Version, which is a little more difficult to get. But when I set up my scriptures online on the Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible, I generally tend to stick with King James. So I know that's not the most popular choice, but it's the one I prefer. Uh, Geneva is a good one. Uh, I think the Wyclef is a good one but pretty much if they got killed for translating it into English or giving it to the common person then that's probably one you want to go with I think Tyndale is another one so Tyndale, Wyclef, Geneva, King James so those are the ones I would recommend the highest but any Bible can get you um, the word and although some has been altered or omitted or added to um, I've seen the Bible I've seen everybody get what they need from whichever one God wants to use whenever he wants to use it and when it's time to get a little bit more diligent then I would say upgrade so I know it's more difficult for those of y'all who uh, don't have English as your first language but just stick with it <laughs> Uh, actually, the Bible is one of the best teachers of English that you could find. So, I would say get a translation in your native tongue and get a King James Version and compare the two. That would probably be a good way to get some English. And we don't use all the English words anymore. Some of them are a little archaic. But, for the most part, other than the tenses, it's right on the money. So, it's not as complicated as it might seem. Um... Uh, just get some confidence and boldness, right? So, New King James isn't bad. Prefer a uh, regular King James rather than new, but really I would just say get in where you fit in. I don't know y'all's reading level or comprehension level, but you get whatever God's leading you to do. I would say get that, so. I think you can get this one. I've got Zondervan paperback. It's got commentary, cross-references got a lot of stuff in there that's really good. So, I think you get this Zondervan, yeah, it's Zondervan, King James, study Bible, personal size. It's got maps and a whole bunch of cool stuff. I don't agree with all the commentary, but uh, you can get it for about 20 bucks for 
a cheap good Bible that's pretty pretty reasonable I think so that's <laughs> that's my uh, uh, that's my take on all that so hopefully that'll help pokey cookie he's like who is that <laughs> it's been a minute so yeah, it's cooler today than it has been. I'm still leaking over here. But oh well, right? It could be a lot worse. Today it's not the heat so much as the humidity, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> for the end of August, it could be way worse, that's for sure, so. But yeah, I appreciate you guys being here. I'm gonna just jump right into it. I don't have a whole lot to say. I could say a whole lot, like always, but I got a feeling Timothy will have enough for us in there, and I have no idea what the devotionals have, but I'll make extra careful sure that I'm not going to stick my head onto the electric fence there. <laughs> I'm mildly traumatized. I haven't been back ever since. No, I was back one time, I think. Okay, so... I hate the selfies, but hey, here we are, right? So, we'll get into the devotional first, and I want to thank all you guys and girls for your continued support and y'all's uh, perseverance and diligence sticking with me. It means a lot. Um, consistency means a lot to me hard to find these days so I believe it's the 31st let me just double check that yeah 31st it's my buddy's birthday today a couple of my buddy's birthdays a lot of birthdays lately actually so let's see August tomorrow is another buddy's birthday um, okay so it says Isaiah chapter 51 verse 5 it says, on mine arm shall they rest. Or God says, on my arm they will rest. And Mr. Spurgeon says, this is the morning devotional, so apply this to your day if it's your morning, or apply it to your uh, day if the morning's already come and gone. See if it applies. Um, okay, so, in season of severe trial, the Christian has nothing on earth that he can trust to and is therefore compelled to cast himself on his God alone. Of course, the him and the his and the he and all that can be equally attributed to a her or a she. So I always try and change that out loud as I go, but to save my brain, uh, y'all understand. So, okay, so. In season of severe trial, the Christian has nothing on earth that he can trust to, and is therefore compelled to cast himself on his God alone. When his vessel is on its beam ends, and no human deliverance can avail, he must simply and entirely entrust himself to the providence and care of God. Providence is like divine ordinance, so just in case you don't know, we've covered it before, but... The eye on the dollar bill is called the eye of providence, okay, if you want a technical term for the seal, but there's the one-eyed, all-seeing eye of not the God we serve, and then there's the providence and care of the God that we do serve, so. A uh, happy storm that wrecks a man on such a rock as this. O oh, blessed hurricane that drives the soul to God and God alone. There is no getting at our God sometimes because of the multitude of our friends. But when a man is so poor, so friendless, so helpless, that he has nowhere else to turn, he flies into his father's arms, and is blessedly clasped therein. When he is burdened with troubles, so pressing and so peculiar, that he cannot tell them to any but his God, he may be thankful for them, for he will learn more of his Lord then than at any time. O oh, tempest-tossed believer, it is a happy trouble that, d that drives you to your Father. Now that you have only your God to trust to, see that you put your full confidence in Him. Dishonor not the Lord and Master by unworthy doubts and fears. Well, at least 
there's no chemtrail, right? So, yeah, I see a silver lining. <laughs> okay, so dishonor not your Lord and Master by unworthy doubts and fears, but be strong in faith, giving glory to God. Show the world that your God is worth 10,000 worlds to you. Show rich men how rich you are in your poverty when the Lord God is your helper. Show the strong man how strong you are in your weakness when underneath you are the everlasting arms. Now is the time for feasts of faith and valiant exploits. Be strong and very courageous and the Lord God shall certainly, as surely as he built the heavens and the earth, glorify himself in your weakness and magnify his might in the midst of your distress. The grandeur of the arch of heaven would be spoiled if the sky were supported by a single visible column, and your faith would lose its glory if it rested on anything discernible by the carnal eye. May the Holy Spirit give you to rest in Jesus this closing day of the month. Wow. Okay, so rest in the Lord, guys. Don't let unworthy doubts and fears enter in to your mind, even if you get bad news, okay? Uh, there's quite a few people on my mind and heart that are going through something right now that this speaks directly to them. Of course, some of it applies to my life as well, but... O oh, tempest-tossed believer, it's a happy trouble that drives you to your father. I've said before that sometimes God will, it, every knee will bow. Sometimes if He's calling you, many are called but few are chosen. If He's called and chosen you, there's not a whole lot you can do to run away from God and His plans for you. Okay, so if that's the case, sometimes I say in order for God to get people down on their knees, He'll cut their legs off. Right, and if that doesn't work, He'll cut them off at the hip. And he'll keep going up until all you have left is just a head poking up, looking out looking up that's all you can do is look up and at that point when you've hit that rock bottom and pride or pride or pride got in the way sometimes we sometimes we have to fall as far as we possibly can before we're willing to humble ourselves and look up and one of the things he mentioned there was it's easy when you have friends and other things to lean on to bypass God Right, the carnal, tangible, material things that are in our face or in our immediate vicinity that we can reach to that's more tangible than a faith or a hope in God or a trust that we can put in an unseen a belief. You know, Faith is the belief in the things unseen. So to have faith in God, it's one thing to believe in God, it's another thing to have faith, right? And so faith is the belief in the things unseen. Once you believe God when you can't see Him, you'll begin to see His handiwork. You'll see His fingerprints on things, you know, metaphysically speaking. Um, you'll, you'll see Him in your life confirming to you a lot of things. But uh, when I got my DWI, I just lost my daughter. I didn't drink the entire time. I went through the whole process. And when me and the mother went completely separate ways, you know, uh, it was a hard time, right? My dad was sick and almost possibly going to die at the same time. I mean, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But I say this uh, to express a deeper truth, right? Is that during that whole process, I leaned on God. And I trusted in my faith, and my faith was uh, fortified, you know? I mean, it was consolidated into one place. And I literally, all I had was either... On one hand, a nervous breakdown where I'd probably kill myself self-medicating, and then everybody would pay the price because I was a lot of the glue that held things together during that time for my family. But if I was the old selfish person I used to be, I wouldn't have cared. I would have probably gone and done worse things than alcohol and been found face down in a ditch. Uh, luckily, or blessedly, I didn't choose that path. We got a lot of air traffic going today. It's a little odd. And it's too loud for me to hear myself talk or think, so I figured I'd wait, but... Uh, I think that's care flight, so... We'll pray for those guys, because that's probably not a good deal. But, um... But yeah, so I leaned on God the entire time, and my strength in God was renewed. And I can't say I was having joy in the Lord at that time. 
and so it wasn't that strength but it was in my weakness it was either uh, lean on myself and my own understanding and the old ways that never worked before or to lean on God and I leaned on I chose God and only by his grace and mercy did I make it through that time unscathed although I got the scars to show the battle you know for it spiritually speaking and uh, emotionally psychologically all that stuff I mean pretty sure I got the PTSD probably like three times over from a lot of the, these kinds of things but my whole point is basically that after all that went down after the after everything cooled off after the heat was as hot as it could get and then you know me and the mom parted ways and I'm still taking care of my family and such uh, at that point I reached out to two maybe three friends and I didn't get anything reciprocated back and it's very rare that I ask for a prayer for me very rare that I ever ask for anything for myself um, I just I don't think about myself very often so it's not like I want and need things uh, I'm a very odd character in that way uh, different than most so the one time I do reach out now I even gave it a window of opportunity you know flexibility I reached out to three people and got nothing now you could chalk it up a million ways hindsight 2020 maybe I reached out to the wrong people that's possible maybe I um, Maybe I just wanted somebody to be there, and there wasn't, and not in the ways that I needed. And so, I mean, it was, it was a sad time for a lot of reasons, but at this point in hindsight, that's when I went and hit the bottle one time. It wasn't like I went and got, you know, wasted completely, you know, just to drown my sorrows. But I was drawing a portrait, and I think I took a shot here and a shot there, and I was drawing for hours, so I didn't really think about the accumulation. Um... But I left my house and I went to go see a friend and uh, woke up in jail. So, bad story, a good ending, but had to pay the price in, in the meantime. So, I look back in hindsight and think to myself, I leaned on God through the hardest of the hard times. And I leaned on God through everything. And the one time I didn't lean on God, I reached out to my friends. Uh, I burned myself with stupid ass decisions. And everything happened for a greater good because I love him and a lot of people got helped out of the process and I learned some hard lessons. Um, but to make a long story longer, if those friends hadn't been there, I wouldn't have reached out to them. So it's easy to bypass God and go to people or more tangible things. And in that, that could be a ploy or a snare that's going to take you in the wrong direction or open a door that God meant for you to be knocking on his instead of theirs. That's a good opportunity for the enemy to network with familiar spirits also because they know when you're hurting and they know how you're hurting and they know how to alleviate the pain temporarily just to lure you in deeper so uh, yeah so that's that I would just say lean on God trust in him if you're no matter how hard your time is and what you're going through you will get through it right and if you don't get through it then it's all for a purpose anyways so a lot of times we struggle through other people's problems, but, and this is a hard truth I had to drop earlier, and I'll say it for anybody else that it might apply to you, but life goes on for the living. And y'all have heard me say many times, it's easy to die, it's very hard to live. So if you have somebody who's dying, or someone who might die, you know, I know a bunch of people right now that have cancer, they've either had cancer or they just got found out that they've been diagnosed um, you know one guy who my heart absolutely breaks for had aneurysms had stroke had brain surgery came back I think he broke his leg then he accidentally burned down his wood shop and now he's been diagnosed with stage four terminal either brain or lung cancer or both I don't remember but it's it's one of the most messed up stories I've ever heard of how could somebody be brought through and to all these hardships and then to make it out with faith and hope and then to get that at the end, you know, and he's deteriorating very quickly. We've been praying for him for a couple weeks, but he's, uh, it's advancing very fast. I don't look for him to be around a whole lot longer, but I'm not going to fail to pray, so... Yeah, life's hard, so get a helmet, buckle up, that's what I say. And it's a hard truth, but life does go on for the living. Now you can die with the, your loved ones if you want on the inside. You can let them take a part of you with them. 
but that doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do God any good. So God has a plan and a purpose for everybody, and it's appointed once for men and women to die, then judgment. So we all have our appointment, and whenever it's God's time to pencil us in, there's not much that can stop that. So just know one of the things that really helped me a lot was focusing on what the, the person who you know goes home, focusing on what they've gained rather than what we've lost. Because it's always, how does it affect me? How does it change my life? What about my memories? What about my future with this person? How am I going to go on without them? Uh, how, is, how are things going to be different with that void? You know, and so let God fill that void. That's what I would say. But you have to give him the right to come in and do that. Plus, you have to let go. You know, I hate the cliche, let go and let God, but it's true. Um, and the other one is let Jesus take the wheel. And so I usually say, Jesus is the wheel. If you realize that once he's driving and steering, uh, don't just let Jesus take the wheel. Realize Jesus is the wheel, and then you can. there's nowhere you can't steer that God doesn't um, want you to go. But that's, you know, is enough with the play on words. We'll get into Timothy, we 20 minutes in, so. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this picks up where the other one left off, but... Okay, so Paul's telling Timothy, You, therefore my son... Once again, another utterance of him being a son. That's not brother. Hey, brother in Christ, that's you, therefore my son. Not a spiritual connotation, a literal, physical, my son. Okay? Now we talked on the live... Um, the live stream on the prayer call and a couple of the other Timothy breakdowns or gave a review I believe Paul looks at Timothy as his kind of um, you know his his son kind of like Abraham looked at Lot you know Lot was his nephew closest thing to a son he had until Ishmael same thing here I think Paul never had any kids so I think he looks at Timothy as a son that he never had right and so uh, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you, sons and daughters of God, my brothers and sisters in Christ, take these words from Paul and place them straight into your own heart. Be strong in the grace, and grace is what we don't deserve, that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, be strong in that, because that's what we have. Verse 2 says, And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses the same commit you to faithful men who shall be able to teach others okay so he'd mentioned before things that you've heard about him and I, I mentioned about gossip and people being tail bearers spreading lies okay Timothy's left at um, Ephesus and Paul's moved on to Macedonia talking to the Phygreans I think at this point he's in prison so when he says this um, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses. Okay, so when you have witnesses, they establish a thing as to be true. The same commit to faithful men. So, what you've heard of me, commit the same things you heard about me to others, right? That are faithful, who shall be able to teach others. So, all of Timothy so far has been talking about leadership. Either A, how to Timothy should be leading and appointing these things, or regulating or how people that would want to be more active members of the body of the church congregation how they would go about getting into positions of leadership and what the expectations are so here we have faithful men who are able to teach others uh, commit the things that he's heard about Paul what Paul's done you know like monkey see monkey do lead by example well, example that Paul set, other than everything Paul's instructed Timothy to do, add those two things together, and that's what you pay it forward to faithful men who shall be able to teach others, who will teach others. Um, now, verse 3 and 4 I have blocked off already, and this is very important, and I think it ties right in with what we were talking about with Mr. Spurgeon. Verse 3 says, um, Thou, therefore, or you, therefore, and therefore is like an exclamation, if you didn't know. It's like exclaiming a thing. And usually, therefore, is kind of the, the, the concluding statement. So, this is this, therefore, 
that, right? So therefore, this is saying you, therefore, because of everything he just had built up in chapter 1 up to this verse 3 in chapter 2, uh, you therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay, so right here, this isn't just a... This isn't just a uh, term of endearment that Paul's using to Timothy. This is a term for all fellow believers. You, fellow believer, endure hardness. Endurance is me, you know, not giving up as soon as it gets tough. It's to persevere, right? Endurance, <clears throat> if you run a long, long race, if you have no endurance, you will not be able to finish the race. So it's endurance, and as far as body is concerned, a lot of times it has to do with cardiovascular, your ability to breathe, pump blood, and not get overheated, you know, your muscles not to fatigue to failure, those kinds of things. It takes training to have endurance. So to endure hardness, it's going to take hardness to let you learn what your limits are. And even when you hit your limits, lean on God and put all your trust there. But as a good soldier of Christ, endure hardships. Okay? So, there's good soldiers and not so good soldiers. But either way, you're called to war as soon as you're born again. Now, I don't know many, you know, newborn infantile babies that are stuck out in the middle of the battlefield. But 18 is pretty young, and that's when they go. Can go. So... The quicker you can mature in the spirit, the quicker you can um, be more of a force in the battles to come, or the war in in full. Now we know who wins the war, but the battles are hard fought, and we've got a lot of battles between now and the very, very end, so just keep that in mind, okay? So you therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man or woman that wars, okay, so we all war, but nobody man or woman that wars entangles themselves with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier okay so let me read it backwards because I get a lot out of reading things backwards not completely like gibberish backwards but just going from the end to the beginning and reiterating it no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Okay, so let me reword this. Jesus, right, who has chosen us to be soldiers, uh, is pleased, but only for those good soldiers who are warring on behalf of Jesus Christ, enduring hardness, not entangling ourselves with the affairs of this life. Okay, we have life eternal. We've got eternal things to be looking at. We've got a kingdom perspective we need to have. It's kingdom of heaven. Not our, our county, our, our state, our city, our country. It's none of that, right? And I think to myself, between the tempest-tossed nature of how life can, you know, throw you for a rope, and um, what Mr. Spurgeon said, about leaning on God in your times of trial and tribulation. Here, we're being told to endure hardness, but not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. So how many of the hardships that we endure in this life are of this life? An affair of this life? Okay, pretty much everything that happens to you in life is a physical thing that's happening around you or to you. So, are we going to entangle ourselves in those affairs? Doesn't mean don't be privy. Doesn't mean don't be observant. Doesn't mean don't be acknowledging. But entangling is getting caught up in it to the degree that it's no longer fruitful or good. So, if you want to please God, and you want, in particular Jesus who chose you to be a soldier, many are called if you were chosen. Right? Well, if you've been chosen to war, a good war, and fight the good fight and endure hardness in the process and don't entangle yourselves with the affairs of this world or you'll be caught up so let me continue <clears throat> verse 5 says and if a man also strive for masteries yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully okay where's your integrity and if you're gonna try and get ahead or master a thing in this life are you gonna do it legally and lawfully the right way with integrity or are you gonna cut corners and try and 
you know, step on who you need to step on to get there, to be a, the master, you know. Um, the husbandmen, the laborers, must be first partaker of the fruits. Okay, if you're a farmer or someone who grows or someone who raises livestock, whatever it is, when it's time to give the um, harvest, right, the first fruit of the harvest should be the person who's doing the labor and the work. Okay, first of all, you have to check the quality, right? Say if you're growing a patch of watermelons, well, when watermelon season's over, it's time to harvest. If you harvest them too early, they'll taste like crap. If you harvest them too late, they won't be good. So, of course, the person growing it should have the first rights to tasting it. But it's also the fruit of your labor is good. So, you should be able to have the first benefit of your own labor. I think that's another thing that's important. So, the main lesson is that the dedicated effort will be rewarded, not necessarily monetarily, but in enjoyment of seeing the gospel produce changed lives in regard to being a partaker of the first fruit. So, and as far as uh, being the soldier and, and those things too. But verse 7 goes on, and I have verse 7 through 17 blocked. So the next uh, 10 verses I have uh, blocked off. So we're at 31 minutes. Okay, and it says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. So, pay attention in other words. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. So let the Lord give you understanding if you'll open your ears to hear, and consider what Paul is now about to say. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Okay, well, Jesus' gospel and Paul's gospel were the exact same gospel, just FYI. So, the seed of David, he was the son of Jesse. Jesse was the seed of David that uh, Jesus had to arise out of, gen uh, genealogically speaking. Verse 9 says, Wherein I su Okay, so the gospel he's referring to says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. So although Paul, by doing the right thing, according to the gospel, has suffered trouble, and he's been considered an evil doer, even though he does good, um, even under bonds, which means that he's been enslaved, or he's been taken captive, or arrested, either or, or all the above. But even in bonds, the word of God is not bound. You can't stop the word of God from manifesting and doing what it wants to do. Even if you're in prison, shipwrecked, whatever it is, right? Okay, so therefore I... Now Paul's given a, a lead by example statement here. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. Okay guys, if y'all are listening to this and you believe Christ was your Lord and Savior and that he resurrected, you are one of the elect. So Paul endured all these things for your sake, my sake, and everyone else that's ever believed. That they, us may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, Christ died on the cross and was resurrected. Okay, we die daily to the flesh. We take up our cross, which is a death sentence, and we follow him. When Christ told the guy, take up your cross and follow me, that was before he was crucified. That was a prophetic foreshadowing of him being crucified. And at that time, to tell somebody to take up a cross and to follow me, that would be like saying, hey, die to yourself, put yourself in the electric chair, turn it on for a while, and then come with me. You know, that's pretty much what's waiting for you is death. So, if we be dead with him, okay, if we died in Christ, with Christ on that cross, we nail it all to the cross with Him. We give it all to Him. Okay, then we're dead to the flesh and we're born again in the Spirit. That's what being born again is. Now we have eternal glory with Christ because we're, our God is a God of the living. Well, as He was resurrected, so shall we be. We will be as He is. Okay, and He's risen. Well, we will rise as well. So it is a faithful saying, which means you can trust this. For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Okay, so if you're suffering right now, for his name's sake, you will reign with him. 
If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. So remember we talked about help my unbelief? Okay, well, as long as you have faith and you're faithful, God can't deny himself because if Christ dwells in you, God can't deny himself. Even if you feel like it's 1% of God in you and 99% messed up, sinner, blah, blah, blah. Well, that 1% God can't deny. Something is better than nothing. I'd rather you be hot or cold. Right? So, let that make you hot and get on fire. Verse 14 says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Okay, and this is, we covered this, and this is one of my favorites right here, because, um, the subversion of the hearers, you want to be able to persuade people that are listening to you, and you want to have a persuasive argument, attitude, or action. Love and action is nothing more persuasive than living the love. Okay, when you exude and embody the unconditional love of Christ, people see the light of life in you period um, it's it's really cool actually uh, I've got a couple stories I could tell about that when I was in prison but I don't have time so um, but remember these things charging them in front of God right that they rather it be us or the people who he's saying that are faithful that are going to be teaching or the deacons, or the bishops, or the elders, or the, um, what was it, the widows, young and old, or whatever it be, strive not about words to no profit, contend not with words that go with no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So if you can't be persuading the person who's listening, I think we've all talked to people who have deaf ears you try and tell them the truth they don't want to hear truth you come tickling their ear and their ego oh they'll listen to you all day long tell them an inconvenient truth rather than a convenient lie see how quick that you're on their good side right especially when you're trying to talk to god now this is the key if you're talking to fellow believers okay there's a nice graceful long-suffering patient kind way to say things then there's a way you can say it and you can be an ass Okay, well, most people aren't going to listen to an ass, but they'll listen to somebody who's nice. Okay, you can say mean things in a nice way, and people will be a lot more persuaded by it, or a lot more reasonable to listen. Good Lord, man. How many airplanes is that? And I know we live by the airport, but I've never seen it like this before. Must be a busy time of year. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's not too crazy on the audio, but we'll see. Um. So yeah, being persuasive is very important. Now I'm not saying you're going to trick people into believing. If they don't have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to hear anything you have to say anyways. Especially if you're not coming correct or with the love of Christ. If you're not acting Christ-like, they're probably not going to take you at face value for the words coming out of your mouth. Strive not about words to no profit. If you're saying things and it's not getting anywhere, it's not getting through, move along. Maybe you planted a seed, maybe you watered a little seed, but uh, move along or else because you're not going to change the here. You catch more flies with honey. That's a saying we have here. So power, life, and death is in the tongue too. So if we serve a God of life and we want it to be sweet in the mouth and sweet in the belly, not sweet in the mouth and then bitter in the belly. So now verse 15 goes on to say, study to show yourself approved unto God. The only approval we need is from God. And when we study, we don't study to share it with other people. We don't, we don't study it to um, incorporate into a particular doctrine or theology or teaching. Uh, we don't study to show nanny nanny boo boo, look what I know that you don't. We study to show ourselves approved to God. Okay, And it's a workman that needs not to be ashamed. So your studies, when it comes to God... You should not be ashamed of your relationship with God. And a workman is someone who does work. How much work are you getting done if you never open your damn Bible? Okay, well, I'm, not, I'm nice. I do nice things. Okay, well, doing nice things is works, but works without faith is dead. Where's your faith? You're not going to... Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. 
And if you have God, then reading it is hearing it. So if you don't have God, you can read it all day. You're not going to hear it. So I'm just I'm encouraging and motivating you guys to crack the book open every now and then and be a workman or woman, a workwoman that needs not to be ashamed. How ashamed would it be if you're trying to approve yourself to God, but you never opened the word of truth? Because that's the last part of this sentence. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman slash woman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How can you divide the word if you don't know the words? And how can you tell which ones are true or not if you don't read them? How can you rightly divide if you don't know the word of truth? So the word is the sword also. If you want a sword, good luck going to battle without some kind of offensive weapon. It can happen, but it's not going to be very effective if you have to go hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> what a loud evening. I'm just amazed right now. Verse 15, 41. Okay. Wow, I'm like 10-minute intervals right on the dot. That's cool. Um, okay, now verse 16 goes on and says, But, there's always the but, right? But shun... Or turn away from, or discredit, or cast down. I mean, shun could be a lot of words, but it's not good, and it's do away with, in other words. But do away, do away with, or shun, profane and vain babblings. Okay, so, I don't babble as profanely as I used to, with profanity. I've dropped the F-bomb last time, and ass here, and a few words that are not, that are uncouth, right? I'm working on it. And I apologize if I've offended anyone with my words. But profane and vain babblings. I, at one point I used to say the F word every other word. So I've come a long way. Uh, I'm not getting pride or arrogant about how far I've come. But God, no man or woman can bridle the tongue. So I've prayed for God to help me with that for years. And it's paying off. But it takes a long time sometimes to work it in or to get results. Um... But shun profane babblings, okay, that's easy to do, and vain babblings, okay, so when people are talking about themselves, people are being vain, you probably think this video is about you, you know, <laughs> uh, shun profane and vain babblings, both of them together in unison. I would shun either or or both, but, and this is why, right, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So, profane babblings is ungodly, and vain babblings is ungodly, but profane and vain babblings will increase unto more ungodliness. Not just ungodly places or thoughts or words, but it'll do both. And their word will eat, as does a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Okay, so these two guys were sowing discord in the congregational body. They merged Gnosticism to a degree into the belief system of the church. And in that process, threw every, uh, quite a few people's faith off track. Now they said there is no second coming of Christ. That the resurrection had already happened. So the resurrection when he was resurrected on the third day, you know. I don't know how this applies to Acts when the Pentecost and Jesus shows himself a few more times. But ultimately, they said there would never be a second coming, an end of the world, right? They thought all of that happened with the first temple, or that, that temple being destroyed that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. So that's the second temple. And um, I believe more than likely there will probably be a third temple, and it'll be a temple to the Antichrist. Uh, a lot of people will believe it's... Uh, you know, a Jewish thing that's coming back, but I think it's just in order to have the abomination on desolation take place. Not everyone agrees with that. I don't really care. Uh, that's for another time. But these two guys were in error concerning the truth and the doctrine and the teachings and the gospel of everything Paul's been talking about. So, of course, I would imagine he's also saying these guys had profane and vain babblings, that they were increased unto more ungodliness, at one point he talked about giving certain people over to the devil. I believe these are two he would have let be given over to a reprobate mind. And they probably went and started their own thing on the side. Okay, so now you have even false Christianity back when? Before we even had a true Christianity set as far as uh, 
anyways, I won't go into that, but verse 19 says, nevertheless, right, so regardless of all that negative, here's some positive, hopefully. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let every one that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay, so iniquity is sin, and if you claim to be a follower of Christ, depart from sin, or in other words, repent. Everyone that names the name of Christ should turn away from sin. If they willingly know that it is sin, they should not willingly do it. We all fall short of the glory. We all have our weaknesses. Some of us even have strongholds or attachments or demonizations. And there's methods to dealing with those things. So we're not perfect, but we're supposed to try to be perfect. And the seal of the Lord is that um, God knows those who are His. Okay? In a great house, there are not only um, vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Okay, so if you purge yourself from all the stuff that he's written to Timothy so far, then you can be meet for the master's use, or fit for God, uh, the master of the great house of heaven's use. So, if God makes some vessels of gold, some of silver, which are of a higher status, and then some of wood and some of earth, which are more earthly in status, uh, you have got clay, less permanent, then you got wood, more permanent, and silver, more permanent, precious, gold, most permanent, most precious. Maybe not most permanent, but I think you get the gist of what I'm, go what I'm saying. Uh, if a man or woman therefore purge themselves from these, they will be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Okay, if you're not right with God, you might miss some of the work he's got for you to do. If he wants you to be a cup of gold, but you're only up to the silver level, you know, get your act together, and maybe you'll be ready to be the gold vessel. I don't know, I mean, just... Do right by God, you know. <laughs> do the do your best at all times, and when your best is falling short, your best will get better. But you got to be doing your best at all times. Now, this is always spoke to me here. Uh, verse twenty three says, "But foolish." No, wait. Verse twenty two. Flee also youthful lusts. I've been a lusty dude most of my life, so I mean, I'll admit I'm a guy. Uh, less than some, but more than others. Uh, lust has always been a problem. I like beautiful women. Sorry. I think women are the most beautiful thing God created on this earth. Maybe even in heaven. But I won't know till I get there. Um, but youthful lust, you know, as you get older and more mature, it can... The battle gets a little easier. But for the most part, as long as you're a man, you're going to have hardships when it comes to pretty girls. Especially the way people dress and make themselves up and the culture and blah blah. I'm not making excuses at all. And women have the same problem with lust that men do. They just hide it better, I think, most of the time. Uh, so flee also youthful lusts. And lust isn't always connotative of sexual desire or attraction, etc., etc. Uh, but follow righteousness. And this is a laundry list. Anytime I see a list of good things, make the list. If you have pen and paper handy, write, it, write this down. Uh, flee youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So follow them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Follow peace. Follow charity, which charity is agape love, if this is the same Greek word used here. Uh, unconditional love with action. Uh, faith, belief in the things unseen. Righteousness, being upright, walking right, standing right, not curved, not crooked, not perverted, from the straight and narrow. Those are the things you want to hold on to. And then 23 goes into the negative. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. So I'll tell y'all, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there are foolish questions. And unlearned questions avoid. So if you know better, don't ask a stupid question. Or a foolish question. Don't ask an unlearned question. Knowing that they do gender strifes. Right now, 
I see a lot of people asking rhetorical questions, not giving the answers. And in asking the question and not giving the answer, it's stirring strife, especially with people who don't agree about what the answer should be. One person very particular into the Hebrew roots stuff is doing that. Asking questions that have answers, but the answers are should be clear cut if you go the direction he wants to go with it. If you go any other direction, then you're going to stir the pot with people who are not followers of that guy, or that are followers of that guy. And I've just seen strife after strife engendered by these questions that have no answers. Some of them are vain, I would say vain babblings. Not necessarily profane, but it's kind of one of those nanny nanny boo boo attitudes. So, foolish and unlearned questions avoid. If you know better, then teach better. Don't ask to get people up to the level. I and mean, there's different teaching styles, but I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm really resonating with this. Guys, don't feel foolish or unlearned to ask questions if you're coming from a humble and honest heart and you want to know but y'all all know people who have asked questions only to paint you as the person answering into a corner to try and further a debate to where they make you feel wrong i'll never do that to you but i will put you in the hot seat sometimes and ask you a series of questions um, but that's coming from a good place and it's to make your brain think so maybe I need to correct my approach because making people's brains think sometimes is not the best method, especially on spiritual matters. So if it creates strife, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men or women, apt to teach, which means quick to be teaching on something you know about, patient, we all know what patience is. In meekness, okay, not in haughty attitude, not in holier than thou, not in uh, looking down my nose at you because you don't know and I do. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. How many of y'all know somebody who can speak one thing out of one side of their mouth and in the same damn sentence say the exact opposite out of the other? It's scary, okay? Or when you see someone... Let's say a Hillary supporter, for instance. You know, they can talk about all these social justice issues, but then when it comes down to it, do they hold that same standard to themselves or their own views or the own actions of the people they support politically? I find a cognitive dissonance often to where, give Hillary the free pass, but let's hold uh, X, Y, and Z accountable. Put their feet to the fire, but our person gets a free pass. That's opposing yourself. Okay, if you're a liberal and you have liberal views, that's great. More power to you. It's a free country for a while. And you're allowed to have your own views and opinions. But don't sit there and talk about you can say what you want and you have these freedoms and rights if you're willing to undercut somebody else's. That's not a true liberal philosophy. That's a totalitarian, more on the right side, ironically. So that opposing yourself uh, spiritually, you know, I love Jesus, but new age, new age over here. It's You can't serve two masters, but you have to be able to identify who the masters are before you know who you serve. Well, once you know Christ, it's it's game over, all right? So, in meekness, instructing those, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure, now peradventure means by chance. Nothing's left up to chance by God, but it's chance, time and chance happen to all people. So if your chance lines up at the right time at the right place according to God's will, then if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So if you humble yourself and you acknowledge the truth, then if it's God's will to do so, He will give you the repentance that you're looking for. Now you turn away from the sin, you turn your mind from it, but if we're bound in those chains of sin, if we're slaves to sin, even after we get born again, those chains still have to be broken, right? And there's power in the name of Christ and the shedding of the blood and He came to set the captives free. Okay, well, we're still captivated sometimes by the, the youthful lusts or whatever it is. I keep saying if you've spent a whole lifetime being wrong, God can, you're a new creation in Christ, you renew your mind, right? In, in the scriptures, you die to the flesh daily. So there's a process in the process, though, at some point, God has to be the one that liberates you. That's where deliverance comes from. You're delivered. Alright? And this last sentence here to finish. 
and so it's and right it's an addition in the conjunction there and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will so let me read that backwards so the devil who has taken them captive at his will they themselves may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil if they will acknowledge the truth and God peradventure will give them repentance by those that are instructing with meekness so we have teachers apt to teach patient teaching and meekness all these things these are the people who are being taught that are caught in the snares of the devil by the devil at the devil's will God will let you out of those snares or give you the the power of Christ to be liberated or delivered out of the snares if that's what he wants so let me see about this devotional we're running out of time if you walk in the light as he is in the light first John chapter 1 verse 7 says as he is in the light can we ever attain to this shall we ever be able to walk as clearly in the light as he who or is whom we call our father of whom it is written God is light and in him is no darkness at all certainly this is the model which is set before us for the Savior himself said be you perfect even as your father who is in heaven is perfect and although we may feel that we can never rival the perfection of God yet we are to seek after it and never be satisfied until we attain to it the youthful artist as he grasps his early pencil can hardly hope to equal Raphael or Michelangelo but still if he did not have a noble bow ideal okay before his mind he would only attain to something very mean and ordinary or mean as average but what is meant by the expression that the Christian is to walk in light as God is in the light we conceive it to import likeness but not degree we are as truly in the light we are as heartily in the light we are as sincerely in the light as honestly in the light though we cannot be there in the same measure I cannot dwell in the Sun it's too bright a place for my residence but I can walk in the light of the Sun and so though I cannot attain to that perfection of purity the truth which belongs to the Lord of hosts by nature as the infinitely good yet I can set the Lord always before me and strive by the help of the indwelling spirit after conformity to his image that famous old commenter John Trapp says I'm guessing that commenter is a contemporary or someone that came before but uh, that famous old commenter John Trapp says we may be in the light as God is in the light for quality but not for equality we are to have the same light and are as truly to have it and walk in it as God does though as for equality with God in his holiness and purity that must be left until we cross the Jordan and enter into the perfection of the Most High mark that the blessings of sacred fellowship and perfect cleansing are bound up with walking in the light so although it's getting dark now let us walk in the light Heavenly Father we just come for uh, come before you humble uh, ever so patient and faithful to you God that in our devotionals we've uh, committed and dedicated this time to spending with you and fellowshipping with one another and we thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom that you shared with us we thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and we just pray and intercede and supplicate on the behalf of all those who have needs we need protection we need guidance we need wisdom we need your patience and your long-suffering and everything that we're going through God let us lean on you with 100 percent absolute faith knowing that you are the one true God and that none can come before you and that you are our rock and you are our tower and our fortress that we run to so let us run to you now in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits God and let us serve you and please you and in Jesus Christ's name we pray amen <laughs>